if someone were to invent a drink, a beverage, and that beverage could give you clarity of thinking, if that beverage could make you understand the purpose and meaning of your life, if that beverage could actually teach you how to get along way better with anybody else in the world around you, if that beverage could explain conflicts in the world that are going on as well as conflicts in your own life, if that beverage could eliminate fear, if that beverage could bring you comfort, if that beverage could bring you peace, if that beverage could bring you joy, what would you do to get your hands on that beverage? Well, looking at dietary books that are out there and how much you know people are talking about how they'll feel better and look better if they just follow this diet, I would say people will do almost anything. That they'll pay huge amounts of money. They would actually have an inordinate amount of time. They would sit and they would study. They'd meet with other people to do it. They would go after these diets and say, how are you doing your diet? They would learn recipes. That's what's going on with the recipe world. So I would guess with the beverage world, it would be pretty much the same. Sort of the irony of all of this is that God has given us this book. And he said, in this book will be all the answers to life's questions that you will ever need. In this book, will you will understand how the universe works. In this book, you will get the understanding of the past as well as the proclamation of the future. Joy, peace, comfort, the elimination of fear, power from on high will be given to you if you read and study this book. And I'm always amazed at us, all of us in American culture, who just simply can't be bothered. You know what I'm saying? It's tiresome, right? And, oh, I don't want to do that, you know? Let's get together and do a Bible study. Oh, how about a group that plays miniature golf instead, right? We kind of like that, right? We're like, oh, these Bible study opportunities. Like, in truth, there's this thing that we Christians have, which is an understanding of, I know God has spoken. God from on high has said, I passed along my word to you so that your life can have meaning and purpose and you can understand it. And yet I'm amazed at how many of us Christians can't be really bothered taking the time to deal with it. Right? We're like, oh God, I'll give you my Sunday morning service and I hope Rob explains it to me and then we'll be good to go. Right? And I think that perhaps the challenge in us is that God is saying to each and every one of us a couple of things. And one is he's saying, I have answers for you that Rob's never going to get around to because there's certain issues going on in your life that aren't going to come up in the passages he's discussing. So I need you to search it for yourself. I think God will also say to us, there are voices that are trying to speak to you to knock you off the truth I've given, and sometimes you can't discern which of the voices are right and which of the voices are wrong. And I need you to bear down and learn the truth. I wonder, like, you know, what's, what's really, what, why do we not, I guess the answer is, why do we not believe it? Why do we not believe that God's spoken through his word? Or is it just that we're like, I'm tired, I don't understand it, so I gave up, right? Or, as I see more often, people will start questions and statements with, well, I believe in a God who, or I think God is, and basically it's a fill in the blank with uh, like, well, have you studied that? Have you found that in scripture? And the answer is usually no, it's just, you know, what I feel more comfortable about. So a lot of people are inventing a God of their own imagination as opposed to discovering a God who's really out there. And we've all done that. There's a passage in uh, Acts chapter 17 where the Apostle Paul is on this missionary journey. And he goes to two different cities and he has two radically different encounters in these two cities. But I think it's going to teach us a little something about appreciating and understanding his word. So if you've got a Bible, turn with me, open it to Acts uh, chapter 17. And... Uh, I don't know where it happens or when it happens. It could be during the week, but somehow Bibles are getting left behind either in church or in a cafe. And there's some over there that belong to somebody. If you're missing your Bible, it might have ended up here in the long run. So check that on the way out. we got blue and white Bibles on the tabletops in front of you. But I'm going to be reading from a New King James. Uh, and it's a slightly different than your NIV in the translation for no other reason that the print is bigger. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. So, All right. So let's look at Acts chapter 17. Let's read this story. It says, now when they had passed through Amphopolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as, well, as his custom was, uh, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. 
And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of their evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Okay, let's pause just this far. Uh, okay, I got a couple slides, some pictures of where they would have been. Uh, I think the first one's a map. They worked their way down from Philippi. Paul and Silas just got beaten, and then they got left to put in prison and left in jail there. The next morning they were released. They got out, but they have been severely beaten, and they worked their way down to Thessalonica and did the program freeze up on us again, Ben. So I just keep talking, and you'll reboot it. Okay, so they had worked their way from Philippi, and you'll, you'll see on the map this journey would have been they passed through two rather significant cities before they came to Thessalonica. And I always think that's weird. It's like God was just leading them and moving them. I'm assuming that two things were going on. One is maybe they just were physically trying to just rejuvenate themselves from having been beaten so badly and left in prison. And uh, although, you know, they're walking on this journey, it's probably 70 miles. So, you know, it's, they may have just took them a little longer to rest. They finally get to the city of Thessalonica, which in modern Greece is pronounced Thessaloniki. And I've been there. It's a pretty major city. Uh, even in modern times, it's a major city. But in ancient uh, Bible times, it was also a huge city as well. It was a very significant. It was the Roman capital of the province of Macedonia during Roman times. So the head leaders there are sort of the chief leaders of that whole region of northern Greece and Macedonia. And uh, so they're, they're going to Thessaloniki. And it's interesting because they get there and Paul's going to go back to his normal custom. In Philippi, he couldn't do his normal custom because there was no synagogue. The normal thing he would do is go to a synagogue, walk in there, and begin to preach to the Jews who were there, and all of the pagan Greeks who converted to being what they called God-fearers. They weren't they had converted, converted to Judaism, but they were God-fearers, meaning they were people who had left the whole pagan life behind, began to study the Old Testament and learn from it, and then Paul would walk into the synagogue, and he had all this scriptural knowledge of the Old Testament he could bring to bear. That was his typical mode. He couldn't do it in Philippi because there was no synagogue. So when he gets to Thessalonica, there he does, goes into the synagogue. And it's interesting because it says, it says in verse uh, 2, Paul, as his custom was, went into them. And for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. There's interesting words. He gets in there, and all he has is the Old Testament. The New Testament hasn't even been, hasn't even been written yet. All he has is the Old Testament. And so he goes into the synagogue, and these words that he uses, actually they're lawyer-like terms. For three Sabbaths in a row, for three Saturdays in a row, he shows up at the synagogue meeting, and there in the Greek he's presenting a, explained like a lawyer-like case. He's presenting a case like a lawyer would present evidence, proving... This Messiah who we've all been waiting for, this Messiah who was proclaimed in the Old Testament, the Messiah who was promised, I'm going to show you in the scriptures some interesting things. The scriptures teach the Messiah was going to suffer and die and rise again. And then he goes to the Old Testament and shows them all these passages they had overlooked. And then when he's done with that, he goes, now let me present to you some new things. And the new thing is Jesus Christ, whom I've already told you about and continue to tell about, is that Messiah. And you can look at the scriptures and you can see for yourself. And many of them are persuaded. Many of them are looking and they're going, yeah, we, we get it. It's interesting. It says, some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks. Interesting. Some of the Jews were persuaded, but a great multitude of the Greek pagan people who had come alongside and sat in the synagogue, a huge number of them, and uh, Luke's way of speaking, and not a few of the leading women, is Luke's way of saying a whole bunch of the leading women of the city, of the leading uh, sort of the, the, the societal women of the city believed, and they were following as well. What's going on here? We could have rebooted the computer by now. Are we still not getting close to shut everything down? So give me my, I'm kind of looking for my maps here so we can explain. So, okay, 
So the whole thing is interesting because uh, he has this group of people who are following him, and there are these leading people and these devout Greeks, and they have been convinced from just the Old Testament. How many of us could prove Jesus is the Messiah if we had no New Testament? You're given just the Old Testament. That's all. All you get is the Old Testament. And you're going to say, okay, prove to somebody that the Messiah, who was promised, must suffer and die, and he would rise again. And then you could say, okay, now it's Jesus. And I think most of us, I mean, we could probably do Isaiah 53, some of us. Some of us couldn't even get that far. But most of us probably could not prove Jesus is the Messiah. We couldn't present a lawyer-like case from just the Old Testament. We desperately need the New Testament, which, thank God, we have it, right? And it's interesting because a whole bunch of people come on board. But in verse 5, it says, The Jews who were not persuaded became envious or jealous. And they took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob to set all the city in an uproar. That's just crazy wild. So what had happened is the Jews who were not persuaded, instead of just letting it be, got super jealous. And instead of reuniting the good thinkers, the people who they knew were like, hey, you're a devout Jew, you're a devout Jew. You've studied the scriptures, you've studied the scriptures, you've studied the scriptures. You know, let's all of us who've studied the scriptures rally together and try to refute this call, and let's get the people back on the correct side. They don't do that. Instead, they go to the riffraff that's down in the marketplace. The marketplace uh, in ancient cities were the hangout spot, right? It's like me saying, let's go down to the bus plaza in downtown Spokane, and let's recruit some people to our cause from the bus plaza, right? And you know, they're not recruiting them because these guys are intelligent thinkers. They're recruiting the riffraff. They're recruiting the mob. They're recruiting the people who will do violence and harm and don't even care about all the issues. And so the only thing they can resort to, because Paul for three weeks in a row has so refuted their arguments, laid out such an incredible case that all they can do at this point is get the riffraff riled up. And what they do is they get him going, and there's an uproar. They attack Jason. Jason must have been the guy whose house they were staying in, that Paul and Timothy and Luke and the guys who were with him and Silas and the little entourage they had had been staying at somebody's house. When they arrived in Thessalonica, they had to stay somewhere. So Jason probably put them up. And for three weeks, they're staying there. Later on, Paul is going to be interesting because Paul's journey will go from Thessalonica. He'll go down to Athens. And then in Athens, he's going to send Timothy back to Thessalonica. Paul's going to journey on to Corinth. And then Timothy's going to check out what happened in Thessalonica. He's going to come back down, meet Paul in Corinth. And in Corinth, Paul's going to write the Thessalonican church a letter. Because Paul had only been there three weeks. That's the maximum amount of time he spent in Thessalonica. So when he gets out of Thessalonica, he ends up traveling in Athens, then traveling down to Corinth, and then he sends word Timothy back, and then Timothy gets with him. He writes them a letter, and he's encouraged. He's glad that there's churches holding on. A few weeks later, it's like, I was only there for three weeks. That's all I got to teach them. And he writes them a letter that is passed down through time to us as the book of First Thessalonians, the first letter he wrote to the Thessalonian church. It's one of the earliest books written in the New Testament. And it's interesting because some of the things he says in there give us a clue about what he did. And one of the things he said is that he had not done any, he had not taken any finances from them at all. That he had worked while he was there. He had worked his own way, so he paid his own way. He worked night and day, and then when he got to the weekend, he focused on dealing with the synagogue. So that was a kind of a cool thing. And he brings up several topics to them. And what do you think the number one topic was that he addresses in 1 Thessalonians? The return of Jesus. If you only had three weeks to lay a groundwork and teach somebody about Jesus Christ and about the gospel and about Christianity, what would be one of the number one things you would bring up? And it's interesting, Paul obviously brought up Jesus coming back. Because in 1 Thessalonians, that's a major part of the book discussing when will Jesus come back, what will the signs of the times be like, and all that sort of thing. So it's a fascinating study to look at. And so he's done this, and he writes that letter, that, that will unfold. But back to our story, Jason, of uh, the mob that's been recruited out of the marketplace, this riffraff mob, ends up showing up at Jason's house. And there at Jason's house, this mob is like, bring those guys out. Bring them out here right now. And they're just going to beat the snot out of them. And they're going to, it's just this unruly what's going to happen down there. But guess what? I mean, for some reason, Paul and Luke and Silas and Timothy, they were like, yeah, they stepped out to lunch. They're not even here. 
So Jason has to come out, and the mob, he, Jason's like, they're not even here, they're not home. The mob's going to ransack the house and everything. So they grab Jason, they yank him in front of the magistrates who were there at the marketplace. Oh, yay, here we go, here we go. All right, so you can see that they had gone from Neapolis to Philippi. They could gone and they'd end up in uh, Thessalonica, you see, where the red line meets uh, the city of Thessalonica, right there on the Gulf Coast. I think the next slide shows the terrain they would have walked through, uh, that kind of thing. So you can see Philippi. Over here on the right side, they had wandered in. The white line kind of shows the path they'd on, and then they end up in Thessalonica. So it's a, it's a crazy, adventurous kind of ride to get there. They end up in Thessalonica, and I have some pictures here of what the modern city looks like. It's a major modern city today. It's got a fascinating history. It's been sacked. It's been conquered. It's been reconquered and reconquered. It was one of those major port cities that for the next 2,000 years was significant to everybody who ever conquered the Ottoman Turks to the Crusaders, to you name it. And they still have some of the ancient, that's a Crusader-era uh, tower that's there on the coastline. I think the next slide shows what it's like, because I've been there. I've been to Thessaloniki. Uh, Tanya and I have been there. And it's funny, because in the downtown area, you can walk around, and they go to build a new building. And what will happen is they'll start digging up the new place, and they'll discover some ancient ruins. And by Greek law, you have to stop all construction until the archaeologists can have at it with the site. So you get to the downtown areas, and you'll see stuff like this. In the middle of a park, it's like, oh, we found some ancient Roman ruins. And there's these ruin, ancient ruins that would have shown you this would have been about the time Paul was in Thessalonica, these ruins. And it's hard to tell in this picture a little bit, but right dead center, just uh, above the park and below the apartments, is the remains of a small amphitheater they had where they would have done Greek plays. And that's this. You could wander around and wander through those ruins and stuff. And that kind of pockmarks all over Thessaloniki because they start to build a building and next thing you know it's like guess what you can't build your building you're on some ancient historical site now all of Greece is an ancient historical site for crying out loud so wonder they can build anything no wonder their economy's in a shambles uh, so yeah, that's what it looks like in Thessaloniki and then I think the next slide is their travel to Berea which you can see on the far left hand side Berea a little mountain town so let's let's unpack this a touch first so Berea what ends up happening is Paul gets, basically, he comes back after lunch. It's like, and Jason's like, holy smokes, you should have been here. A mob came, dragged me before the magistrates. And the interesting thing the Jews had said is that they were really angry. They and the mob had said, these men are, have turned the whole world upside down. Which means the reputation of Paul and the reputation of Silas, the reputation of Christianity was already spreading so far that even way up in Thessalonica, they're like, oh, we've heard of you guys, you Christians. We've heard of you. The word is spreading already. You've turned the world upside down. And they mean the whole Roman Empire is talking about you guys. We can't go anywhere now and not have reference to you. And then they get this thing, and they said that they've turned the world upside down and come here too. Jason's harbored them. And these are all acting, saying there is another king, Jesus. Right? And they troubled the crowd of the city. So it's interesting because the Jews have now cited, they did this under when Jesus was going to the cross, now they're doing it again. The Jews are supposed to say, according to their word and their law, God is their king. They have no king but God. That's what they're supposed to say. But here, even in Thessalonica, they're like, why are you mad at these guys? Because they're saying there's another king, a guy named Jesus, and we're only going to let Caesar be our king. Caesar's our king. Once again, they're saying, not the ways of God, but the ways of man. Not the ways of what God wants us to do, but the ways of what the political system's ordering us to do. That's going to be our default answer. There is no other king but Caesar. And these guys are proclaiming, there's this other king, a religious spiritual king, a messianic king named Jesus. And we're rejecting that so that we can follow Caesar. And they're using this because they know the political power will side with them if they make the argument that way. If they make the argument that it's a spiritual issue, they won't care. So they take a pledge from Jason, which is basically, okay, dude, you need to put up $20,000. If there's unrest in the city, we're keeping it. So he gets basically fined. He has to post some bail. And they kick Paul and Luke and Timothy and Silas out of Thessalonica. And they move on, and they head up to Berea. And I think I've got some pictures of Berea. They go down the road here. And Berea is this cute little mountain town. And it's spread out on a hillside. It's gotten a little bigger. I think we were there over 10 years ago. And I loved it because it's like this huge valley. You go down the valley, it's all farm country down there in the valley. So you, we'd sit in these little cafes, 
And we'd be sipping away, drinking lattes in the cafe in the town square in Bree. And I'm like, well, what do you guys do for a living? Well, most of the people were farmers. And so they live in the community of Berea, but they farm down in the valley. And that's where they kind of, we'd go down there, we'd make it, and they would have a little hut down there. It would be like a little home that they would kind of live in while they're down there. But then, you know, they'd come home to their main house, which would be in Berea. Great little coffee shops, cute little restaurants. We liked it. And it was funny because as we walked around there, uh, there's a couple of archaeological sites, and I think the next slide will show us, uh, oh yeah, the monasteries of Vieira, we call it Berea, they call it Vieira, are just outside the city. And there's old uh, middle-aged monasteries. We went up in those things. The monasteries of Meteora, those were beautiful. A little hard to get to, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, we went through all those. And then I think the next pictures, yes, this is the site where the ancient synagogue of the ancient Berea was. And you can see the three little steps leading up to the picture in the center. Those steps are the actual archaeologically dug steps to the ancient synagogue. And they have those three steps leading to exactly where the doorway, the entrance was to the ancient synagogue, which has since been destroyed and no longer exists. And so they have this little map and these mosaics there. And in the far one, you have uh, the man of Macedon calling Paul over to the vision. And in this side, he's teaching the Bereans. And in, it's a little hard to see, but they're digging through their scriptures. And that's, that site is there. And so that's what Berea is like. And interesting, when they get to Berea, it says, When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. I think some of your translations will probably say noble-minded, right? These were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Interesting thing, when it gets to Berea, the same pitch happens. He goes into the synagogue, he lays out his lawyer-like case, he presents his evidence, but the people of Berea respond differently. Instead of going, cool, let's just follow you, you sound great. They're like, okay, I've heard your evidence, but now I'm going to take these scrolls home. I'm going to go home and study the Old Testament. We're going to get together in different groups, and we're going to actually read it for ourselves and see whether it really says what you say it says. And then we're going to come up with a conclusion. Either you're right or you're wrong, but not because you said it, but because we have researched it. And it's interesting because God is speaking through these words. The Holy Spirit is speaking, and he says they're more noble-minded. It's an interesting Greek term. It means high class. They're high-class people. That's what the word really means. So God is basically saying, through the power of his Holy Spirit, those who are willing to take the Bible, go home with it, study it, research it, and not take someone's words for it, are higher-class people. That's God saying it. That's what he's actually saying. They were more noble-minded. The word actually derives from the ancient gentry where there would be lords and nobles over the serfs. That's what the word means. It's that category of person. So God is saying, those who are willing to do that are high-class people. Everybody else is supposed to be trailer trash. <laughs> right? It's going to be sitting here like, I guess I'm more trailer trash than I thought I was. You know? But that's God's way of talking about it. They're speaking these high, noble words. And then later on, it's interesting, because later on, Timothy's going to become the leader of the Ephesus church, which is like Ephesus with the L.A. of the Roman Empire. And in his old age... Paul's going to write his young protege, Timothy, some letters. And he's going to say in 1 Timothy 4, 16, he's going to say, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourselves and, and your hearers. He writes a second letter to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 15. He'll say, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. He says this to his little young pup, Timothy, way later in life, when Timothy's an older man, he gives him this, this thing. Like, by now, Timothy is the bishop of Ephesus. And Paul writes Timothy saying, be warned of two things. Watch your doctrine. You might wander off path. Why would he say that if it wasn't possible to wander off path? He's saying it because there's an emergency going on. Be careful. It's still easy to be led astray. And the other thing he says is make sure that when you open the Bible, you rightly handle it. There's a way to interpret and a way not to interpret it. 
There's right and there's wrong. There's ways in which the Bible can be understood to bring forth belief systems and ways it can be twisted to bring forth the wrong belief systems. And he tells Timothy, don't get swayed into that bad habit. Why would he warn that if it wasn't possible to do it? And why would he tell a bishop, be careful? And if he's been willing to say to a bishop, be careful, how much more you and I? It's interesting because a bunch of people from Thessalonica, you could read the story, will end up coming to Berea and chasing Paul and Timothy out of there too. But I'm struck by how easy it is for us to drift. How easy it is for us to stop being high class and start becoming trailer trash. And I had this experience in the last two weeks. A, a Christian guy who travels all over the nation. In fact, he goes to nations. He travels all sorts of, he travels across the oceans. He goes down to South America. He's invited to all of these churches across America to come and speak. He's sort of a named person. And somebody uh, that I know, uh, who's not part of this church, but part of another church, was a big follower and said, you need to read this guy. It's phenomenal. And I was given one of the person's books. And so in the last two weeks, I was reading a book, and it was interesting because this guy who travels to all these churches and speaks, he was teaching in this book that we are pre-existent spirits, and we are actually birthed in heaven as spiritual beings. And we're perfect in heaven, and what we do is we sit down with God and some angels, and we map out a life plan that we want to have. It's not to the detail, but it's a basic trajectory course of the life plan that we want to have. And then, when birth time comes, God takes our spirit, he puts us in a human body, and we forget the plan. And the goal of your spiritual life is, remember who you were when you were perfect. You're perfect inside of you. And you need to remember and recall and re-remember your plan in heaven to become the Christian you need to be. I think, that man be crazy. <laughs> right? That's what I think. Now, but look, he travels all over the country. Churches across the globe will invite him. He goes to all sorts of nations. I've got less than 100 people sitting in here. So maybe we should listen to him. He's clearly more influential. He's clearly more powerful. He's clearly got more people agreeing with him. Right? Well, let me ask you. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you think I'm right? How many of you think he's right? And how many of you have no clue which of us is right? How many have no clue? And what would be your clue? How would you know whether I'm right or that guy's right? You better know some Bible. At this point in your story, you better know some Bible. I was talking with a friend, and recently we said it's interesting because the vast majority of false doctrine, bad teaching, uh, corrupt belief systems don't emerge from outside the church. They're from inside the church by someone drifting off. Even inside Acts 20, Paul would meet with the leaders of Ephesus, the church he'd spent three and a half years with. He was longer at Ephesus than any other church in his entire ministry. And he spent three and a half years there. At the very end, when he gives them his goodbye words, he says in Acts 20, watch out because after I leave, some wolves will rise up, even men from amongst your own leaders, and they will lead folks astray. So I, I have some questions for you when it comes to all right, just, just in a nutshell, let's go ahead and submit. How many of you guys think that guy's right who believes we're pre-existent spirits? How many of you think I'm right? Now, nah, okay. Okay, so the majority of, and how the rest of you, you're like, I have no idea. One, right. Some of you are like, I have no idea. Okay, so that's good enough. Fair enough. So here's what I would say. You're going to get this kind of teaching in your life. You're going to get people who say things, lay out belief systems and doctrines, and tell you to do the spiritual journey a certain way. How are you going to know who's right? If you follow that man's advice, I believe you'll be led to nothing. Because his whole belief system is built on a, a truth that isn't true. You aren't a pre-existent spirit placed in a body. So I have some questions. Let me see what I've got here. Does the Bible say when our spiritual selves begin? He says it's before time when you're still in heaven, maybe even before God even made the world. I say, no, the Bible actually teaches that our spiritual selves begin after we're already in these bodies. Who, who agrees with me? I would say, 
Give me a verse. Give me a verse. No, I'm not ready to go ahead yet, Ben. Go back up to that question. Give me a verse. Ooh, you got to. You're going to be hurting. <laughs> Give me any kind of any any kind of verse that you think teaches when our spiritual selves begin. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. You've knit me together in my mother's womb is Psalm 139. So then the question is, who's the me? Just my body or my whole soul, spirit, my whole being, my whole essence, that kind of thing. Then I think now you can go to the Bible Gateway. We might be able to just pop a verse up. Okay. Are we, um, when are we, let me give you a little hint. When is our spiritual self born? Before or after we have a body? Does, does God say when our spiritual self is born, before or after we have a body? You ever hear the term, you must be born again? Anybody know where that passage is? We need to have some serious Bible studies here, folks. That's got to be one of the top ten common Bible passages in the entire New Testament. John chapter 3. Pull up John chapter 3 for me, Ben. John chapter 3. And we're going to take a look. Jesus is talking to a guy named Nicodemus. Now clearly, Nicodemus is sitting there talking to him. So Nicodemus has a body. And Nicodemus must have a soul that's animating the flesh because he's talking to Jesus, right? And Jesus says something interesting to him in John chapter 3. Let's scroll down to you get to verse 3. Keep going down. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. He doesn't say, unless their spirit is woken up. He doesn't say, unless your spiritual self starts to remember. You can't see the spiritual kingdom. Unless you get total recall, you can't understand the thing. He didn't say, it says, you must be born. I ask you, is birth a beginning point or a continuation point? For most of us, we'd say, well, born is when your life begins, right? Oh, we can quibble about, you know, where in the gestating period, but, you know, no one says, well, I'm actually 182 years old. I was here before I was born. Birth is a beginning. Jesus is saying, you must be born again, meaning... There's something inside you, Nicodemus, which doesn't even exist yet. And until that spiritual self is given birth, you can't see the kingdom of God. It's not pre-existent in your body. It's not lying there dormant. It's not waiting to wake up. It hasn't even been born yet. And so Nicodemus says, like, well, what am I going to do? Crawl back in my mother's womb? What am I going to do? And by the time you get to verse 6, Jesus answers again. He says, uh, back up here in verse 8. Back up a little bit. Back up. Uh, verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus sits down with Nicodemus and he says, okay, there's two kinds of birth. One is flesh. Has Nicodemus already experienced the fleshly birth? Yes, because he exists. Right? He's sitting here talking to Jesus. He's already had this birth, the physical birth. And Jesus is telling him, however, you're missing the other birth, which is important, and it's the spiritual birth. And some say, you must be born of water. We quibble about, does he mean baptism? Most people think, no, that's like when a woman's water breaks. Right? You're born the physical birth, and then you have to be born... The spiritual birth. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, the spiritual birth must not have happened yet in Nicodemus, or he wouldn't be saying this, would he? If, if Nicodemus was a pre-existent spirit placed inside that body, Jesus would have said, you must be woken up. You must be brought back to remembrance. You're lying in there dormant and asleep. He doesn't say that. He says, you must be born again. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 3. You don't have to pull this up. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter chapter 1, 23, For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When I say this, some of you are going to go, Oh, of course, there it was. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. 
Not an old creation waking up. A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And in this verse, which I think is the nail in the coffin, Zechariah 12.1. You can type that one in. Zechariah 12.1. You understand Jesus is saying, no, your spirit is not pre-existing. The spiritual self of you actually comes when you receive being born again. Zechariah 12.1. It's a Bible verse that tells us, when is your spiritual self coming to being? A prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. When the prophets speak, the Holy Spirit's the one talking. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person, declares, and then he'll go on and say the prophecy. That verse clearly teaches your spiritual self is born inside when you already have a body, not in pre-existent time. Right? So over and over, it's like, find a verse that says we're pre-existing, very, very difficult. Really can't be done. What it comes down to is, uh, when I, I used to laugh, I'd say, when I was 28 years old, I'd been to church for 10, 15 years by then. I remember sitting there thinking, I've heard everything. I never heard a sermon teach anything I didn't already know. I never heard any pastor ever preach something. I'm like, yeah, I knew that already. Yeah, I've heard the story already. Yeah, I knew that. Right? And I was so bummed. At 28 years old, I'm like, dang it. I'm 28, and I know everything Christianity has to teach. And now I got another 50 years of hearing the same old stuff over and over and over. And I was so bummed, right? And then I went off to seminary a few years later and realized not only did I not know the answers, I didn't know the questions. For instance, are you a traditionist or a creationist? <laughs> what are you talking about? Here's the question. When God made Adam and Eve, did he put inside humanity the ability that when they procreate, that act of procreation actually produces a human soul? That the soul is created, knit into the entire way God made the fabric of human beings. Not just a body is made, but the soul and spirit of a human being is also inside the DNA. And God actually gave human beings the power to create souls and spirits. Now, he gets involved somehow while still in the womb. You knit me together in my mother's womb. He forms the spirit within them. Somehow, in the gestating period, he's also involved. If you believe that, you are a traditionist. Right? And many Christians are traditionists. That God gave the power to create the soul to the human beings. And there's some evidence for this, by the way. I mean, if you've studied anything about people who are adopted... It's amazing how much they can be just like the birth mother or father once they finally do an investigation and find out people I've never met in my life, never saw in my life, and I actually have mannerisms that they have. I have personality traits that they have. I have intelligence. I have things that are in me that are part of, and they're not my body, they're part of my actual personality that actually came from my birth parents. So traditionism would say, yes, that's what God did when he put together Adam and Eve. And then when Adam and Eve fell, but the sign is why the sin nature is passed down through the ages, because it was put in the very act of procreation from the beginning of time. The other side are called creationists. Creationists believe, no, God only gave the power to human beings to create the physical flesh, the, what you would look like, how big your nose would be and your ears and colors of eyes and hair, skin color. The God did that. And then after, at some point after conception, and at some point before birth, God puts the spirit or soul inside a person. Catholics and Reformed Church are this. Many others are this. So I ask, are you a traditionist or a creationist? And most of us would say, I have not studied enough Bible to even know the answer to either of those. Right? And you see why I went to seminary and you're like, I, I don't even know the questions. I thought I had all the answers. Are you kidding me? I never even, I never even thought about this kind of stuff. You know, are you a traditionist or a creationist? What do you think God did when he created Adam and Eve? Right? And I think there's evidence for both, and you'll find Christians on both sides of the spectrum, because what it comes down to is when Adam and Eve fell, and they rebelled against God, and sin was passed to all human beings, how did that happen? How did that go about? If it is sin only in the physical body, and because we have physical bodies, that's what causes us to sin? 
And because, you know, God puts a soul in the spirit, does God put a tainted, warped soul into a human body when it's an embryo? And he puts a sin nature in there? He does that? Or is it somehow he puts a pure, holy, righteous spirit in the while, while we're gestating, and then because we have physical bodies, we're corrupted? What is that, right? Do we believe that? If you believe that, explain Jesus' body. Was he sinless or not? Yeah, oh, wait, that's a different question. For a creationist, over here, or a traditionist, I mean, they would over here say, no, when Adam and Eve fell, they actually, their DNA became sort of warped and twisted and corrupted, and the very act of procreating passed on the sin nature. So not only is your body corrupted, from the moment you're born, you're going to grow old, get sick, and die. But also, your spirit and soul, your nature is corrupted too. And unless God does something fresh, it's not going to happen for you. So in the sin nature, whether you're a traditionist or a creationist, how does your sin nature play out? And when God rebirths you, for a traditionist, they would say, what happens is God comes into the scene, and he, by the power of his Holy Spirit, he comes in and he inhabits, and he takes the, the, the person and starts to make them more like him. And then we get to the next question. Are human beings two-part or three-part? Are we body and soul... Or are we body, soul, and spirit? Ladder. Right? You say the latter. You're saying body, soul, and spirit. Which are we? Are we body, soul, and spirit? Is that the fact is, if you're a creationist, we're body, soul, and we were meant to be spirit, but the spirit died at the fall with Adam and Eve. And so therefore, it wasn't in the DNA to pass on. Or you get over here to the creationist side, it's like, well, we're only body and spirit. And when God puts his Holy Spirit inside of you, that Holy Spirit inside of you begins to wage war against the real you who is corrupt and evil and which is a sin nature. And until they start fighting, until the Holy Spirit takes over you and transforms you from the inside, you're never going to become the person God wants you to be. You see, most of us don't have the answers. We don't even know what the questions are. In the book, and I have a quote here. This is interesting. Go back to the, uh, can you bring that uh, passage back up? Sorry there, Ben. Uh, but there was a quote, I'll read it until Ben can bring it up. In the book, the gentleman said this. He said, when the first man and woman disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, they did not lose the breath or spirit of God, as some might believe. We know this because they did not drop dead. We have already established that the body cannot live without the life of the spirit. However, they did lose access to the tree of life. This meant they would eventually die which the Lord told them would happen if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This new knowledge created a self-awareness to such a degree that they slowly began to forget their former state of glory. In some way, you might say they went stupid. Through this one act of disobedience, the sin nature produced a spiritual amnesia, reducing humanity to mere flesh. So when I read that, it's clearly he's saying, the problem with sin is you have forgotten who you are. I think the Bible teaches something different. I think the Bible teaches, no, it's not a matter of forgetfulness. The Bible teaches you were dead. I think that's what the Bible teaches. And I'll give you, you now, anybody got a verse for me? Am I right? Is he right? Can you think of a single verse? You were dead in your trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2. So Ben just... I know, you've got to reboot. It's a weird thing because the way the software works, I've got to close this program and then reopen it. Well, this one. Ephesians chapter 2. You've got Bibles. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 and 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them... We all too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So when someone tells me, oh no, no, you were born as with a sort of a bad body, but a good spirit is inside you, and you were perfect on the inside because you were pre a spirit, your pre-spirit was good, it was placed inside your body, and now what's happening is you go through life, you're waiting for that spirit to wake up. I'm like, really? Because what the Bible teaches me is that uh, I was dead. Not sleeping, not dormant, dead. Whatever was going on inside. Now, when Paul is saying this, when the Holy Spirit is saying this through Paul to the church, are the people he's talking to, like, dead? Like, literally, there is no animation of their flesh. 
No, he's writing a letter to the Ephesian church, which means all those people are walking around, they're living, they're breathing, they can talk. He's clearly saying there's some aspect of your humanity which is dead. Your soul must be okay because you're able to walk and talk and breathe and eat and have conversation. You have some semblance of intelligence and your body mostly works. Something else inside you is dead. What's dead? Probably your spirit. Your three part, the third part of you is dead. Not just asleep, not just dormant, but dead. It's interesting because it's, he goes on to say, and who are we in league with? Well, we were, according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The spirit that's working in the sons of disobedience. Lucifer. Among them we all too formerly lived. And we were what? By nature, children of wrath. Basically, God's saying, before you came to Christ, you were deserving of wrath. The judgment of God was going to fall on us. You were dead and you were helpless and hopeless. And you weren't going to be able to get there unless God did something. What was missing? Oh, the thing that Jesus said. What was missing is, some part of you must be born Something inside you must be born. And if it isn't born, you ain't ever going to get there. And then he'll go on to unpack that scripture. That birth part is the Holy Spirit coming in and birthing that spirit again that fell at Adam and Eve's time. There's another proof, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verse, verses 1 through, uh, well, let's, well, I'll start about verse 16-ish. Romans 5. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, he's talking about Adam, resulting in condemnation. On the other hand, the free gift arose from the many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. That's Romans chapter 5. That's a good one to study. That's a good one to know. In Romans chapter 5 the argument Paul says is because of Adam... Every single human being is already born dead. So our souls must work and our bodies must work because else how would we exist? What's dead in us? The spirit part is dead. The ability to see, hear, commune with God, understand God, to grasp spiritual things. That must be dead in us. And it's waiting for the time when we come to Jesus and the Holy Spirit can be placed inside of us and rebirth the spirit that died with Adam and Eve. Study Romans chapter 5. He's saying death spread to all men. Because of one man, Adam. But don't be, don't be afraid because life is being offered again through the one man, Jesus Christ. The first Adam, the second Adam. That's how the Bible referred to them as. On and on. I think the Bible teaches actually very clearly that our sin problem is not a matter of just forgetting who we are. The Bible teaches very clearly that our sin problem is, is the fact that we're, we're stuck with, until we meet Jesus, we're actually dead. We're not just sleeping or dormant. We are by nature actually on Satan's side prior to the new birth. We're actually by nature destined for wrath. We're not allies of God until we receive the birth of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's a third question. Is there a righteous spiritual self that is inside of us from the time of our birth? Is there a righteous spiritual self that is inside of us from the time of our birth? In other words, prior to meeting Jesus, the you that's on the inside, are you a good guy? Are you a good girl? What does the Bible teach about that? Because this guy's saying, yes, you are. I say, well, there's some major verses against that. No, and actually, I would say, you want to say something? Jumping in? No, not one. No, not one. No, not, no, not righteous. No, not one. You, gotta, you know where that is? <laughs> Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all gone astray, right? I get, if there's a previous self, I'll submit this to you. If there is a previous self before we meet Jesus, I think the Bible teaches that person needs to be crucified. Crucified, right? I'll give you a couple of verses. Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 5.24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
Now clearly, nobody actually except Jesus and some criminals actually were physically crucified. When he's saying this to the Galatian church, Paul means it symbolically. He means there's something else inside of you that needed to be crucified. The previous you, before you knew Jesus, needs to be put to death because it's a bad guy. It's a bad girl. And Jesus wants to awaken something good and noble in you. Romans chapter 6. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Romans 8.13, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I think over and over the Bible says, well look, the Bible teaches that our spiritual selves begin at the new birth. And it happens inside of us, our spirit, our body and soul. I'm over here, I'm a, I'm a traditionist, and I believe in a triunity part of human beings. But if you're personally over here, I'd be like, yeah, I would break fellowship with you or, you know, anything, but I would say, prove it to me. You have a view? Prove it to me. Grab some Bible verses. Prove it to me. I'll take my view and I'll try to prove it to you. You take your view and try to prove it to me. I think the Bible says our spiritual selves begin when we encounter Christ. I think the Bible preaches that our sin problem is not just a matter of forgiveness. It's a sin problem that's infected your mind, your will, your emotions, your body. In fact, the Bible even teaches nature itself has been corrupted by the human sin problem. Romans chapter 8. All of creation is groaning, longing for the day of the adoption of the sons of God. Right? Is there a righteous self that is inside of you from the time of your birth? No. Whoever you were before meeting Jesus needs to be put to death. How is that done? By more and more and more studying what he has for me to do. By getting rid of my old habits and my old ways of thinking. By getting rid of the selfishness and the pride that's in me and more and more and more submitting to him. The old self is prideful. The old self is arrogant. The old self is selfish. The old self wants its own way. The old self is all about me, me, me. And God's saying, yeah, that person has to die. When that person dies, you'll start becoming who I want you to be. That's the spiritual life. So I bring all this to you because I want you to know that in your life, Christians inside the church, talented, gifted, anointed speakers who travel the country and preach to you are often going to lie to you. Oh, they don't mean it. I think some might. How will you know when they're lying? How do you know whether or not I'm lying to you? Some are confused. Some are actually devious. The only way you will ever know which preachers and leaders are lying to you is that you have to know this book. You have to study the issues. You have to get together with other people and talk about it. You've got to read books by smarter folks than you. You've got to study this and get together and talk. Hammer it out. Look at passages. Start asking yourself questions of, okay, am I a trichotomist or a dichotomist? Am I a traducionist or a creationist? Boy, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And you're like, I don't even have these conversations. No one goes out to coffee. and You're going to have lunch after church to say, well, what do you believe, man? Three parts or two parts? And what do you, and most, most of us will say, well, I just think it's three parts. What's your evidence? None, I just my feelings, right? That's what we do. We're forming our belief systems off feelings. And Jesus is trying to tell us, I've given you the words of eternal life. I've given you the understanding and the purpose and the dominion of how to have a joy-filled, happy fearless, courageous life that you will enter into eternity strong. And there are other villains out there who are trying to destroy you from ever obtaining that. And I want you to know the difference. That's what he's saying to all of us. I think besides this, the whole teaching of us having pre-existing spirits has some logic problems. So I want to, I, I, I did actually write the gentleman a letter and I said some of this stuff to him nicely. Um, and I said, what about, so you're telling me if we sat down in heaven and had a powwow with Jesus, and then we got born into these bodies, and now we're trying to wake up again, you're saying that's been our plan? What about the millions of people who are going to end up at the great white throne of judgment according to the end of Revelation and are going to be cast into the lake of fire? That was their plan? I think that's a logical absurdity. 
If I was a pre-existent, glorious being in heaven already with Jesus, I'm going to tell you something. I ain't coming here. <laughs> right? There's a logic problem with that. It'd be like, I'd be sitting in heaven with Jesus, looking down at earth, and I mean, all I would need to do is look at the Roman times alone, and I'd be saying, look, I've already seen Rome, I've watched the Middle Ages, and now you want me to be born in the United States of America? I'd be saying, hey, I'm feeling good right here, Jesus. Let's just stay where we are, right? Why would we do that? I think there's some other problems that go on about the priests or some of us. So you're saying maybe only the people who are going to be Christians were pre-existent spirits and everybody else wasn't? That means only some of us are truly human beings and the other people who don't have the pre-existent spirit aren't real human beings? I mean, on and on, just the absurdity of it starts to unpack and it's like, you know what? Unless you're sitting around talking to somebody, how would you know? You're thinking these thoughts, you're wrestling with these questions, you're reading these books, right? Most of us know. By the way, um, you know, I mean, the Christian way to do things in the modern era is, I should have just written an open letter and blasted him on the internet, huh? That's how we do it. He's, I think he's a false teacher. I'm going to blast him on the internet. But I didn't do that. I wrote him a private letter supporting his ministry and saying, I think you've erred, and I think you've fallen into Gnosticism, not Christianity. And I, I beg of you, please drop this doctrine and walk away from it. It'll harm your ministry in the future. Why did I do it that way? Yeah, because the Bible tells me that's how to do it, right? Galatians chapter 6, Matthew 18. If my friend's caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Man. Galatians 6, right? Hey, if your brother's offended you, what are you supposed to do according to Matthew 18? Go to him in private, right? And then if you won't listen, take someone else. And that's not how the Christian community does it anymore. What we like to do is violate the Word of God in order to prove the Word of God. I shall blast him on the internet in an open letter. No. You can't violate the Word of God to prove the Word of God. I have found, and this is the problem with many of us in modern Christians, I've done this too. There's two ways to build your belief system. One way is you take your experiences and then you interpret the experiences you have and then you develop a belief system out of that and then you finally go to the Bible to prove what you've just constructed. And oftentimes, I would say, my charismatic Pentecostal friends fall more into this camp. They have an experience, they interpret the experience, they develop a belief, and then they go hunt and peck in the Bible trying to substantiate that. The other way is that you start with a scripture, and then you develop from there a doctrine or belief. And then you start having experiences, and then you interpret those experiences according to the doctrine you build. I think this is the way God wants us to do it, but I think we all do it the first way. Right? Most of us were mad at God because we had a bad experience. We're disappointed in God because we had a bad experience. We're raging at God because we had a bad experience. And you know what we did? We built a belief system out of that. And then we created a doctrine. And now, actually, we're kind of using a few verses that most of us have bypassed even bothering to look for the verses. We just have our belief system built because we let our experiences tell us what is true. And God is trying to get us back to dismantle that and come back to where you study my word, then you'll develop your belief system, then you'll develop your doctrine, and then when you have an experience, you'll be able to interpret it properly through the system you've built. Because life is not going to be easy. Life's going to be hard. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to feel let down. You're going to be afraid. Negative things are going to happen to you. And when they do, are you going to let those things determine your doctrine and beliefs? Or are you going to go back to the truth of the Word of God and say, I need to reinterpret this fearful, negative, depressing experience based on what God has said and not how I feel? That's the difference between being high class or trailer trash. Right? That's the difference. Dang it! I've been trailer trash for too many years of my life. I have been. And I'm encouraging you not to be. Let's pray. Why don't you stand? Oh, Lord Jesus. To hear you use the words noble for 
people who studied the scriptures before they developed their beliefs. We're coming to you and we're saying, Lord, you, you saw that as high class. You used that word. High class, noble people study your word and they come up with what they believe. They don't just drink it in and swallow it down. And Lord, some of us, many of us are coming here and we're confessing to you, we have not been noble. We've let others tell us what is true. We've not challenged ourselves in their thinking. We've been actually lazy to learn your word. We can't be bothered. It's just not fun. There's other, we have a host of stupid excuses. We come to you now and we confess our stupid excuses. We say, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, awaken in me a hunger and a desire for your word. Lord, I can't do it alone. Put me with other people who will help ask the right questions and read the right books. And we can become, we can start thinking together what it is we really want to be and who we really are and what it is we believe. Give me courage, Lord. I confess to you, I'm just, I'm not as smart as I need to be when it comes to knowing your Bible. I'm not. And so, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, make me smarter. And put me with people who will make me smarter. My part is to have the courage, Lord, to hold those meetings, do those Bible studies, read your word on my own. And I want to proclaim that to you, and I want to vow that to you now. Open up, in the next couple of weeks, open up opportunities for me to learn what it is I need to know. Because there's so many questions I don't know the answers to. This I ask in the might and the power and the name of the Holy Spirit of God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Father in heaven.